Buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos a nuestra presentación que hemos titulado Welcome to our presentation called Soho Routers, Swords and Shields. It's a pleasure to be here at CyberCamp and we would like to thank the organization for, for choosing our speech. First of all, we'd like to introduce ourselves. I'm Ivan Sanz and my colleagues are Jose Antonio and Alvaro. And we are a group of friends who started researching about Router Soho. Soho routers detected several vulnerabilities on some of the most popular routers in Spain. And this speech is a summary with a few tips about the experience we got. First of all, I would like to show you how we focused it. It's split in three parts. Swords, to start with, where we talk about different attacks and the vulnerabilities we found and how we can exploit them. The second part is a part regarding shields, where we're going to talk about what a user can do to protect him or herself about the attacks we're mentioning, as well as the mitigation regarding vulnerabilities. And last, a third part called KISS, or KEYS, rather, when we wanted to do a few tips and sum up the key elements regarding these devices. So first of all, we'll give you three short examples about real attacks in Soho routers. This one happened in Brazil. It's a very simple attack based on a script that we can see on the top picture. What it does is it exploits a vulnerability and it replaces the original DNS of the router by malicious routers. And it has a dictionary to do so. I don't know that you can see the image below well, but here it uses the default credentials of the most popular routers followed by the configuration that would go with the link to modify these parameters. And this second attack is very similar. The main difference is that it's an attack that was done also in Brazil and it affects mostly one of the most popular Brazilian ISPs. In this case it's a very similar attack. It changes the original DNSs by malicious DNSs to elaborate a phishing. And if by coincidence the passwords are not the default ones the script itself requests the user to put the passwords, which is one of the problems here. The technology level of many of the users of these devices. The third one is a worm called Moose. It affects mostly Linux devices, creating several processes trying to spread themselves and infecting new network elements. After the infection is completed, it does a man in the middle attack to detect all the captures and possible credentials, cookies, and so on. So these are sent to the malware administrator, and it can also connect to an internet proxy to social networks to like certain videos that report an, an economic profit to the malware author. And regarding routers, we also found some problems that are quite typical that affect pretty much all devices. First one is that they have loads of services that in most cases are totally useless for a user because they don't get used and they're also not very safe. So having so many surfaces creates that the attack exposure surface is higher because you have more vectors where the device may be vulnerated. And some of the surfaces are these ones. We have Telnet, FTP, Twonky, a service that tries to share online a USB with the network, the different computers. The net USB is very similar but it gets installed in high-end routers, routers, or the UPnP, which is quite unsafe or unsecure by default. Some of you may think about a simple way of palliating these problems, at least regarding the unsafe or unse insecure services, which means getting these services and replacing them by their most secure 
equivalent. For example, changing the FTP by FSTP and others. We also find, find another problem with default credentials. In this chart, you can see some of the router passwords we assessed. We can see a lot of 1234, 1234, Armin, Armin. Very simple passwords that are not generated randomly. So one could go just to Google and look for a, a specific router model and find the default password. The problem here is not just that the passwords are easy, but also that these are to the fact that the, most of the users who don't have great technological knowledge do not usually change these passwords. So eventually it becomes a lot more simple to create attacks knowing the credentials of the router itself. But if you thought this was bad, it gets even worse, because we're not just having an account. Usually, we get multiple user accounts, and these accounts tend to be hidden. The ISP tend to use them to give support, but eventually the same thing happens all over again. Someone finds them, they publish them on the internet, we can look for them in Google, and we need to know the credentials of these accounts. So here we can see some examples, such as 1234, ADSL, body. There's a bit of everything. And the same thing happens here. The user doesn't change them, and sometimes they're hidden. So the user doesn't even know they're there. And sometimes they can't even be changed directly. So eventually what we say is that the usability of the Soho routers and the ease for security administration is very far from an optimum level. So let's begin talking about the first part I mentioned, the swords. We're going to expose several vulner vulnerabilities and attacks affecting these devices. First, I'd like to speak about the bypass authentication, which is an attack based mostly on the fact that an attacker can carry out tasks of certain changes in the router, the router, without needing any authentication process. This attack may be done locally, and oh, but also remotely. It affects mainly the web interface of the, of the router, and this is due mainly to uh, bad assignation or allocation of the web permits. And then we have other services such as SMB or Twon Twonky. This is due to the fact that these services are not well configured. To start, I'd like to show you a video. Well, we'll see how easy it is to detect these vulnerabilities in the web interface and exploiting this to carry out certain attacks such as the denials of service. And what we get here is a machine with a browser connected directly to a Soho router. So we have the login screen we're going to have the credentials and this is like a normal book router like the one you could have home so here we could have the typical configuration please look at this because right now the security here is open and the name of the network it is DSR and we'll see why next on the other hand we'll open a machine where we're going to ping the router IP to check that it's actually alive and working. And next, with a button we have on the left, in red, the restart button, is a button to restart the router, although you need to be logged in beforehand. To do that, we're going to open Burp Suite and have the interception model. If you press the button, we can see the capture, the exact capture. And here we can see it's an HTTP GET request that gets to the reroute info.cgi resource. This is what we're sending when we start the, root, the router. So we're going to copy that and we're going to drop the package because we don't want to restart it, we want to do it when we're logged in. Okay, next. We delete the cache, we close any open session so that we're not logged onto the router, and on the 
right hand side on the corner below we can see a screen and we can paste the capture we've done and here we see the logging screen and if we copy the request to start with the screen is going to change as we'll see next and here it says the router is being restarted and we could actually restart the router by being in the same network the lights are off and the attack has been completed it's a very simple attack and just with a simple script that spams this and sends these kind of requests all the time you could leave any sort of router without service next you may think well what happens if I change the re these requests you made by a different one that may not be a button what happens if we try well sometimes this works and we can just try with restore info which restarts and gives back the router is default value so by writing router.info.gci we can do that here we restarted it so you don't have to see the whole attack and after we go in we could see this as we go down and look at the configuration as we mentioned earlier we can see that the VPA security has changed the SSID is now Vodafone and we can actually reinstall the value the factory values and default values as well as the default credentials that are public and very simple so next I'd like to show you another video affecting the Twonky service that offers users the possibility of connecting a USB to the router so that any user can modify it, upload images, unload them but the problem here is that it's not totally secure to bypass the service it's necessary to have the router IP plus the port in this case 9000 so that we can have direct access to the service in this case it's a typical Spanish family that we hacked and we can actually see the process these are the DATS documents very interesting and if we keep looking at this we can also see the sun's folder and this is danger in this kind of vulnerable systems you can also have videos uploaded here you could check the content and we could find any file that could be there and last it's also easy to and possible to upload on our own content which can be dangerous but in this case we'll go to upload we'll get one of our own images and we'll upload it to the system as we can see it's pretty simple to carry out this kind of attack well let's keep dealing with the attacks and I'm going to tell you about a cross-site request forgery where an attack can configure any router configuration parameter by sending a malicious link to the victim there are several approaches to this attack because you can modify any parameter so we can modify the routers password enable some services a bit of everything but our main aim and the main vector is the, is DNS hijacking I don't know what happened there, but we can't see the screen anymore. Well, here it is back. So we're, more, we're swapping the legitimate DNS service with a malicious DNS server so that all the DNS queries will go to attacker server and the confidentiality of the big thing will be at a stake here. They can be redirected to malicious sites and we could have different attacks on this these kind of attacks requiring embedding the credentials of the router by default otherwise it will not work so this attack is totally feasible if those credentials have never been changed which is the most common scenario and here you can actually see the common scheme 
Here you may see the credentials that we're embedding, followed by the router's IP, followed by the path to the resource we're trying to vulnerate, and the parameters of the cross-site request forgery while vulnerating. So here's an example of DNS hijacking. We're swapping the DNS with the ones we want. We need, we need to take into account the most modern browsers, when we embed credentials, they'll give us pop pop or a warning message such as this one you're about to log in to this site with this username once people press ok but the most use navigator or browser google chrome doesn't show this warning so the attack is totally invisible to the user and the link is a bit suspicious i'm not not apply this whole thing and this is why the shortening services for urls such as bit.ly tiny url or others or only are very useful because they take this massive URL to this tiny one and since there is so much use so much people will not be suspicious we can also do this by creating a website such as this one that posts these parameters very simple we also found vulnerabilities in cross-site scripting which is inserting malicious script on the router's website we can do that even remotely in this case it's analogous which is like the cross-site request forgery because we need to embed the credentials by default so which is the objective of this attack the first one is to do a sense of hijacking stealing the cookie of the session to the administrator user to do phishing and change the configuration but in some routers it's not possible due to the cookies but as we'll see next in a live demo we have the browser infection where we can insert a malicious payload and compromise the routers and computer security and here's a typical XSS popping that message I don't know whether you've heard of beef is a very good tool allowing us to palliate some of these attacks problems a wide part of the input fields in the entry parameters have a character limitation so this allows us to link to more complex scripts that are hosted in the attacker's machine and here we redirect into an IP domain we also found unauthenticated cross-site scripting vulnerabilities which is same thing but done locally without the need for any authentication or embedding process and this is done by sending a DHCP request net to the hostname parameter and here the router answers OK acknowledged and then they will embed this malicious script on the website configuration permanently and we, we can do this attack in different ways we can use a custom script that we've done ourselves allowing us to inject this parameter but we can also use the package manipulation tools such as Scapy, or even we can change the machine name and next time we send the hc the hcp request we can modify it so here are the typical elements with the host name and the acknowledge and below we can see the connected clients table and we would embed the malicious script sometimes this is not so simple and things get complicated as we may see here the injection is a bit more exotic and complex and to achieve these kind of things we need to study the source code the website is trivial but it can take some time if we don't do so we might be destroying things and the website might not work well but with a bit of patience we can achieve everything we also have privilege escalation vulnerabilities I use it with administrative privileges can make changes in configurations and this is why having multiple user accounts is a very bad secure security practice as we see on this router we're gonna vulnerate a telephonic router and we're gonna connect to the FTP by using the credentials of a user that has no privileges the user user this user as even as Ivan mentioned earlier is a user is not hidden but no 
no one is going to change their credentials. So due to the fact that the service is misconfigured, we can go to critical files. There is a list of all the router configuration parameters, including the credentials, changed in flat text. And I can also download the DTC password, as you'll see next. Here we're opening the file we just downloaded, we have the password, and even worse, we're going to achieve the accounts of all users in flat text. As you may see here, user1234 and the password user security is strong, which is a big lie, but from here any user can make changes on the router's configuration. We also found back doors, everyone knows them, and these are hidden administrator accounts, completely invisible to any users. And if a hacker had access to them, they could do anything in the router. And we have found these kind of back backdoors, arming and four digits that the four last digits in the device's mark, followed by IR or com. And there are other passwords such as Wi-Fi, whatever you learn passwords different things. And this WordShare is a router that is flooding the internal network with requests to adjacent TXT resource. And it's actually the router itself the one that is flooding the subnetwork network. And these files have no protection whatsoever. So we can actually obtain the values of the network configuration. So as you may see here the security is very good. As I've mentioned the router is quite kind and it even gives us clues on the password default true. But this is my favorite. It gives us SSID, the passwords, the Wi-Fi passwords, the LUPS ping, but the funniest bit is the name, hiddeninfo.html. Very hidden, as you may see. These are the vulnerabilities of the Universal Plug and Play, plug and play Protocol in most devices. Designed to allow certain applications, such as your favorite torrent customer, to do changes in the router modification in the network, such as opening ports or other things to improve the stability of the performance is something that video games use a lot online. The problem of this protocol is that it's very unsecure. First, because it doesn't have an authentication process, as you'll see next. So not just any application, but also any user with malicious purposes can make these changes. And it's also implemented in a pretty bad way. The objectives are to open the critical ports to remote hosts and pretty much whatever you want. And we can you can use a tool such as Miranda by Craig Hanner. Very well recommended and here we are doing an app for mapping action. A port mapping action. We're opening a port and here on the third parameter we're opening a port for remote host host and this is not supported by the protocol. The problem here is that the parameter is not proven rightly, it's not sanitized, so therefore we can open this. But as you may see here, we can inject blank commands. We can exploit, exploit these remotely, and there are different ways of doing it. And we'll just explain one, which is using a malicious flash file that we host on a web server. So every time a victim connects to the web server, we'll use this flash server, and since the applications may have sub p and p actions, this one will have mapping options. And you may say, why is this useful? Well, this is extremely useful because it will, it will allow us to exploit local vulnerabilities remotely, because we're going to open critical ports towards the outside, towards hosts, that may be very useful for this kind of thing. So after speaking, after these devices' vulnerabilities, I'm going to mention the attacker's position when it comes to exploiting them. We can actually split them in two 
attack vectors first when the attacker connects directly the network where the router is. This is common at a hotel's Wi-Fi, Starbucks or hotspot Wi-Fi. The actor vector of attacks whenever the attacker is able to find the vulnerable router through the internet and exploit it. They can use such tools as I showed them to find that kind of device. There are also vulnerabilities such as the XSS, the CSRF and the UPnP. The need something else by the attacker to be exploited. Here I'm talking about social engineering. And basically the attacker will differentiate two objectives. To get most clicks possible or to focus the attack on a particular victim on which they are compiling information. In the first case, the attacker may use a social network such as Twitter and create a malicious tweet or a very attractive tweet with a URL for people to click with a topic such as the the leaked pictures of famous new celebrities. If we had the name of Carmen de Mairena, Spanish celebrity, we wouldn't have any click. But if we were intelligent, we know they're all there, but they could be evil. So they decide to have the image of this famous club player. And here you will get at least one million users. Of course, you could reinforce the power of these Twitter credibility by buying followers and Twitter retweets. So here we could look at one person compile their information in their email and create a strong vector to to get them. Next, talking about CSRF and these social engineering attacks, I'm going to try to do a demo that is usually done remotely, but in this case I'm going to do it locally since the vulnerable router to the router forgery is not on the internet. But to do this attack we have created two virtual machines. One of them representing a legitimate DNS, such as the Google ones, and also the legitimate website. And this virtual machine has an IP 192.198.127, assuming its domain names and loading the normal website. And we have another virtual machine that represents the malicious DNS and the web malicious DNS server that would be on the internet and that the attacker would like to swap the DNS of our computer for the IP of this malicious machine or computer to affect the domains and point to other malicious website, websites. In principle we have configured the DHCP of our router to give us the IP corresponding to the DNS legitimate web server. If I'm a victim I haven't had any attack and I have this IP and I load in the browser the CyberCamp's website I'll see that there is no problem whatsoever and that this CyberCamp page loads without any problem but what happens if the attacker knows our email address and decides to create an email for us let's say we're looking for work and it invites us to press on this mali to go to this malicious URL, which is the URL that it begins a DNS change in the router. So the victim would click on that, and next the DNS and the DHCP of our router changes, and everyone who connects to that local network will fall the DNS. For my DNS to change, I need to reconnect for the DNS of my computers to be to be refreshed. So here I reload this and I'm going to show you that in fact our computer ZNS has changed and now they point to the IP 192.168.196 what happens if next I connect to the same domain I was connected before, the website of a cyber camp? Here you'll see that the results of this attack are a real disaster. 
Don't get trapped by them because something horrible like this could happen. This is a very bad attack because with the failure of just one person in the local network, all other users connected to it get affected. So here it's a big problem because if we have a good security knowledge but our son doesn't and they press a malicious link and they click on malicious link, all devices depending on those DNS to work will not work appropriately. We're now I'm going to do a little bit of a different demo, it's going to be a bit faster and this is going to do what we talked about with the authentication of uh, cross-site scripting. So as an attacker and changing our host name we are able to inject a malicious code into the configuration page of the router. How do we do this? Well, routers normally have a page where they load all of the devices which have connected and ask for information in order to be able to use the IP, the DNS, and they accumulate them on a, on a website as well as the host name. So we would be able to introduce or enter a false host name. And I'm going to connect again because sometimes it doesn't quite get the doesn't quite get it the first time round. Let's have a look here. The host name is a uh, rather unusual. Okay, so here we've got an attacker, and what about a victim? What the victim would do would be to connect to the configuration page of the router, which is what we have here. Let's see if it loads. So as a victim, innocently enough, we would enter the website or the page with the configuration of our router, and we will go to the HTTP table. And if everything has worked, we can see indeed the winter, the the window with the script. And this is one way of doing an attack. And now Ivan is going to show you another one, a different one. Bueno, la siguiente demo es un escenario. We have a very simple scenario which is interesting nonetheless. It's through scripting and this is going to allow the attacker to obtain, uh, obtain a reverse series and we have this link which I will explain for this and the scenario is basically a router to which an attacking machine is a um, connected to its Kali with an exploit for Windows for Internet Explorer in this case and then on the other hand we have the victim who is or which is Windows 7 with Internet Explorer and so the attacker will send them a malicious link which is the one that we can see here they'll send that to the victim and what we can see is that this link well here we have an attack which is similar to the ones we've done before. We can see the default credentials. We have the defect router IP. Then after that, we have one of the resources where we can make changes in the router's configuration. And we're going to introduce or inject two using two parameters. Why two? Well, these two fields have limited number of characters, so we have needed to divide it between the two. The page, once it's loaded, will begin. It will first of all load the second parameter, which is the host name that we can see here. So when it loads, it will open JavaScript with a window location assign in order to relaunch to the attacker's machine. And the commentary or the comments, the observation. So there's a comment on everything in the page until we get to the second field of the injection, which is this one here. Here simply we just would continue with this injection. We can see that it would send us to the attacker's IP 192.168.135 and with resource number one, which is where the exploit is located. We've called it number one because of the limiter of characters 
characters, a limited number of characters. And upon the exploit, well, I could, or regarding the exploit, it's to do with this vulnerability. It affects internet, specific internet versions, including 8 and 10. And what we're going to achieve is that it's executed on the customer's side and we get the reverse series. And I'm going to do it on the other computer. I'm going to change. I'm going to change the HTMI and we'll continue. Vale. Me oís, ¿verdad? Vale. You can still heal me, right? So, on the one hand, we have the attacker's machine and we can see it's just got the listening and as we can see. On the other hand, we have the email that's been sent to the victim, this one here, where we have a, a, a short field, an email for a job offer, and we've got a field where it says click here to see more details, so that link that we've seen in the past, and when we click it will direct us to the router, and the router with the vulnerability that it has, it will direct us to the attacker's machine, so if we click on it, we can see it loads and this corresponds to the exploit and when we come back to the attacker's machine well it seems to be taking a little while well let's let's see we'll try opening it again okay let's see no it's not working Uh, that's always the problem with a live broadcast. Uh, sometimes it doesn't quite work. Mm, let's see. This is a bit of the problem with client-side exploits. We can have these kind of problems. Sometimes they don't work because it's an exploit which isn't really ours. It's an exploit for Internet Explorer. We could be using a different one for Google Chrome, but we're using this one for Internet Explorer, and our vulnerability is taking it, but the redirectioning is, is working. But sometimes it doesn't want to pop here with the reverse SL. Okay. Well, it's taken us a while, but we've got there. So here we have absolutely full access to the victim's machine. So here, for example, we could see um, the DIR or browse through the different directories, see the user, such like. So I shall pass the floor now to my colleague. Okay, well, we'll go back to the other computer that we were on to start with. I hope there won't be any problems with that. Let's see. Perfect. Well, well, you know, things sometimes go a bit wrong when it's live, but that's what makes it fun. And I'm going to do a demonstration which exploits a vulnerability of the Sambar uh, system. Here we have a server, as you can see. And since it's Sambar, we're going to use a sa uh, Kali. And first thing we're going to do is to list the services that this service, uh, sorry, this router provides. As we can see here, we have a service called Storage, which serves for exchanging uh, USB files. So we're going to connect to the IP of the router and this same resource. We're connected without the need for any kind of authentication. And if, well, because there's a failing in the SMB, we can create symbolic links to any part of the file system, as you're going to see now. So symlink slash, and we're going to call it slash. If we do an LS, here we have the results. And if we connect, we have the router at our service. You know, we can do what we want, we can get the password, or we can get any kind of file for configuration of the router. For example, this one, which is for Diamond PTF. 
D. Okay, and I'm going to have a look what we've downloaded. As you can see, we've got the password, and this can be you know, cracked very easily in just a few moments. But we don't need a, a password to exchange files. We have the configuration file. We've got lots of parameters that we can change. So we don't have time to do it right now, but we could change any parameter. And we come back here. And using the integrated put command, we can do that. And as you can see, we've changed the behavior of the router. Since we're a bit lazy, we've created a big button command, which is basically to download the whole system of files without any kind of interaction. And you can see here that everything's coming down. It's all starting to appear. We're not going to uh, leave that any longer because it would take quite a while, so we'll stop it. But this kind of attack, you have to be very careful because it's not just uh, something that can be done locally but also remotely. Here we've got examples for, that you can look at. You can find thousands of vulnerable routers uh, open to this, and I'm not going to obviously do a remote demonstration because that would be a crime, but I'm going to just show you a video of that being done with a remote router. Obviously, we're not going to see the whole thing, but it's the same, basically, but connecting to a remote router. We have the symbolic link, and it works perfectly well. Okay, so we'll continue with our presentation. And so we're going to talk about shields. We didn't only want to talk about attacks, we also wanted to talk about how to mitigate them. And nonetheless, it's difficult as end users. You start off with a broken shield. You have very few or limited configuration, configuration settings. Several attacks cannot be stopped. And the mitigations that we're going to talk about only work for specific models because each router is completely different. So we're going to propose uh, solutions. And it may work for one router, but not for another. And we have to say it's also not as easy as buying a brand new router because these routers, due to marketing aspects, they include a lot of services. And the only thing they manage to achieve, besides giving functionality, is that they uh, increase the amount of exposure, the area uh, which is exposed. And also we have to say that no antivirus is going to protect you from this. And we say that because there are some antivirus companies which when we talk about vulnerabilities, they include posts on their official blogs reflecting these concerns and but at the bottom they always say buy our protection protection you know product uh, because they will protect you but we can tell you here and now that that's not the case so here we have some advice as users you may wonder where to start well first of all you have to identify your router model and we must also look for the router credentials and we must understand the most advanced configuration interface which allows the greatest number of changes because here we've got two skins from the same router one which is the one that Vodafone wants us to use so it doesn't allow us to change it and the one on the right is the one that's hidden away which allows us to make real changes so you have to use Google to find these things out here we can see the label on the back of the router we've got the numbers the the brand and the passwords for administration but as I said this is for a really limited administration and for Movistar it's much more of the same the model we don't get the passwords but we can get them through Google General recommendations, only log into the web interface when needed. Why? Why do I say that? Well, because if you remain logged on, you could click or fall into some kind of trap, and that link might commit some kind of scripting or forgery, as you saw in these demonstrations. So whenever you finish you with changes, you have to log out on the router, if that's possible, because many of them don't implement that logout, and so you have to rub out the cache or the cash. It's also very important, as we have said, since 
Hi, the hijacking attacks are the most common kind. You have to check the DNS servers that you have. It's very easy. You can do this. You just go into the web of the router. You look at the DNS uh, folder. Make sure it's in automatic or if it's local, then it should be the ones which are the, the trusted DNSs. These are the ones for Telefonica, and here you have it in auto router, and you should do that in your in your operating system. And as you can see, we've opened up Resource.com. We could also we also have to do this with Windows. You have to go to the Control Panel Network, and that's where you can do it. But we have to say that you do not trust shortened links, shortened links which are used in social networks, because they might come with a bit of an unwanted gift. And also, when you browse through the router navigation page, because you might come across this, you might come across this or an attack like the one we saw before. And if we talk about multiple user accounts, it's very important to delete any other kind of account. So just allow the one administrative account with privileges. But this is very difficult because normally there are going to be lots of difficulties when it comes to deleting accounts. But also tr try at least to change the passwords if possible. Although, as I said, this could be difficult. And sometimes you can't mitigate this from as a user. Here we can see two users. Uh, but at the bottom we have a uh, ADSL user that's been uh, established. Here this is Vodafone. It allows us to change the account and then we have four under that. And another Movistar router. And we can see this is very good. This would be the model to follow. Here we can see the privilege of, you know, you can have a list of the credentials, but the thing is that, well, it would be very good if it didn't have a backdoor like this one, which is hidden in the file. And I'm going to show you a demo video of how to mitigate these kind of attacks. We're going to mitigate the kind that I talked about, which is the uh, privilege escalation and the problem with multiple user accounts. So we have the credentials of the user and the administrator, and we're going to download the password. I'm running through this because it's very simple, very easy. So uh, we do that, and then we open it. And as you can see, we have two user accounts and the back door that I mentioned and the user that we've used to do the privilege escalation. And in this case, it's very easy to mitigate. What we're going to do is modify this file with the passwords. We delete these two lines. And what's more, we change the console Bing Cli for SH, Bing SH. So we're going to have greater control. And the only thing we're going to do now is to have uh, to carry out a put with the former password with our values. And very quickly, we would have uploaded that. And we're going to check that these can't be logged, that the user cannot log into FTP. And we can see they have no way of connecting, and they can't escalate privileges. The same as with the ADSL user. And if we look at the website, it would be exactly the same. And also, I'd like to talk about services. Try to deactivate any service that you don't need that's not critical for the functionings of the routers, if they allow you, because usually they will not allow you. And this includes FTB, FTP sorry, and SMB, media service such as Twonky, UPnP, because that's one of the services which is most vulnerable. And if you have local risk of an extreme nature, then uh, you know, deactivate or disable DHCP. And if we deactivate these services, well, these services, uh, in fact, are going to carry on running in the background without telling us. So UPMP, we deactivate it, but it may still receive requests, and so it will still continue to be vulnerable. So it doesn't always work. Here we have some examples. This would be for the FTP server. As you can see, it's very good because it allows us to modify different things. This would be for Twonky to deable or disactivate, deactivate Twonky, and this one for UPMP. But you mustn't trust them because you may still be vulnerable in the background. I'm going to continue now with more mitigation that the end users can do. If we talk about firmware, if the manufacturer 
provides us with the latest version, then we can always try to update it. How? Well, there are two ways. The first one is very simple, just by uh, re-establishing the configuration of the router using a butter, and this would kind of restore it, and it would activate a service which is which um, accesses the, the system, so it takes the most recent software and it loads it. If that's not possible, on the com router configuration web page, there's always a part which allows us to examine firmware that we've downloaded on the internet and to, to load it. Where can we find that? Well, with the operator, we have fora on the, uh, where we can request them, but whenever you're going to download firmware, you have to be careful because it could be malicious and that would give us a real problem. One question that people, many people ask us regarding firmware and open source, if we're advanced and our router is compatible, we could always choose to use open source, but you have to be careful because the, you know, the, the, it's not the necessarily a panacea. If we're talking about UPnP or others, they may correct more quickly, but they cause problems. So, for example, sensors had problems with remote coding and DDD, sorry, DD. WRT also, but the manufacturers one, ones can be patched more rapidly. And if we talk about the manufacturers then, coming on to that subject, the most important thing about manufacturers is that they have to listen to what the security researchers or investigators tell them. So there are lots of services which the end user is not going to need, so they should be stopped by default. The, and the idea of having critical ports close to WAN by default, this would make it much more difficult to exploit them. Although, of course, if we have to wait for the manufacturers to solve these problems, then, you know, well, it's best not to hold your breath, let's say. So. If we have a good administration, administration that's more than enough. We don't need anything else. And if the password is generated randomly in the same way as with the Wi-Fi password, and this, the algorithms for the generation of passwords, it needs to be quite strong because the algorithms normally take the Mac to generate the administration code. So with reverse engineering, they can uh, hackers can obtain the the password, but if the attacker cannot know the elements, for example, the serial number of the router or the date of manufacture, then it will be much safer. Or they could design a safe alternative to UPMP because we've seen that the current one is a bit of a disaster in terms of security. And of course, always avoid unsafe protocols, changing HTTP for HTTPS. So by way of summary, this is really important. This is something that we need to do. And if we talk about the strengthening of devices, we can try to indicate the victim that they should not load inappropriate things and filter everything that enters into the router. And here I say everything because we saw earlier with the Hoshnell that, well, we can have a, a malicious script. So what we always say with security, all input is, all input is evil until proven otherwise. And if we talk about CSRF, there are tokens, they work, they are hashes which are generated and uh, there's a transaction, but when the transaction is completed, they die. And step by step, step with Java code, it's generated, it generates the hash, then it's assigned to the transaction. It's checked on the service and on the client side. And once the transaction has been finished, we have to invalidate that token so that the attacker cannot um, deduce the URL and causes problems. If we talk about the bypass authentication information disclosure, well, we have to avoid a, ut a user from ac uh, an incorrectly logged person from accessing critical elements and service related side of things. We have to check for possible wrong service configuration. Uh, such as the critical ones that we've seen. We have some recommendations for parameters for the file SMB and file and we can see that in this way we can avoid any un incorrectly user from uh, um, entering our cage and another interesting one the wide links means that it prevents links being created going to outside the cage and downloading the whole um, file system of the router okay we're getting to the end with the keys 
And I would just like to say very quickly that we've developed some tools. We've seen some already, but we've also created other tools that will help us to car carry out cross-site scripting analysis. And we've also worked in Pedro Joaquin's uh, project, and we've included the vulnerabilities that we've detected. So now we're going to a bit of a mm, tricky area, the response of the manufacturers. We, s with an average of two to three emails sent each manufacturer, most of them unreplied, and, and most of them just haven't replied. And the small minority that have replied, they've just said it's not my problem. It's the manufacturer's problem. It's the, they say it's the operator's problem. And this really tells us more. This is the number of fucks given, and it's zero. If we talk about Packet Storm and these um, news items uh, that talk about this matter, and the results is that we found uh, over 60 vulnerabilities which have been discovered, 22 router models affected, and 11 manufacturers. Here we can see the winners, as we could call them, the, were the most vulnerable ones. We've got Observer, then Comtrand, Huawei, and Ampere. If we could talk about the different kinds of vulnerabilities, we've got the web kind, which are winning, but we mustn't forget about the ones which are uh, smaller because they can be very dangerous and can be uh, used remotely. So what's the conclusion? Has the Soho router security been improved? Well, it's obviously not been improved because we've found a, a lot of vulnerabilities that can be very easily exploited and will affect a lot of users. So please, we would ask the manufacturers, please, to patch them. Uh, and resolve this. So for those of you that are still awake, just two questions. If I have a router that provided by an operator, I am sure, clearly not, well, it will clearly be vulnerable, but uh, they might think I bought a latest generation router that's got a whole load of services running by default. Well, there, they've got you, because if you've got lots of default services, you're more exposed, and they're going to get to you just like they would to anybody else. So thank you very much, and we'll be very pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much. That talk was really good. What router do you have at home? Well, you start. I've got a country which is very vulnerable as well. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not secure in any way, you know. If I was you, I would take a router which was configurable with one of these ones and I'd configure it as far as possible, but really, you're never going to be secure. Not with anything. Are you familiar with the Nicrotic from Routerboard? They have the Router DOS ones. Yeah, they were vulnerable to a few things as well. So, I mean, well, the thing is, like I said, there are some, well, as we've said, there are some manufacturers which tend to bring out many more security pa patches, and that's better because at least they answer you and they patch things, so they take a bit more of an interest, but they're still vulnerable to certain problems. But it's better, better than the ones that the SSPs give you. You said that there's a li did you say there's a list of vulnerabilities for routers? See, there's a website you mentioned. Yes, it's router pound P A W N. I think he said. You click on it and it launches the exploit. We don't have many exploits there because for ethical reasons, but some of them are here or they're in full disclosure or and you can check that. Anything you need, anything you're not sure about, you can contact us or we'll be outside. We'll, we've got our emails at the end, so we'll be really pleased to help you.